Hey guys, thanks for watching another episode of Easter Egg Hunt. I'm your host, Jordan Ross, and today I'm breaking down all of the Easter eggs and references that I caught in Season 2 of Stranger Things. And this kind of goes without saying, but this video does contain a lot of spoilers for Stranger Things Season 2, and even a few for Stranger Things Season 1. So if you haven't caught up with the show, then stop watching this video now. Anyway, first up is Episode 1, Mad Max. Now the most obvious reference in this episode is the title itself, Mad Max which is of course referring to the movie Mad Max, which came out five years before this season took place. And another classic film that's referenced in this episode is The Terminator, which makes sense because this episode takes place on the opening weekend of that film. So at one point during an establishing shot of Hawkins, we see a movie theater with The Terminator on the marquee. And speaking of the establishing shots of Hawkins, in one of those shots, we see a stack of newspapers being set out to sell. And on the front page, off to the side, we see a headline that says, Baby Faye's Baboon Heart. And this is a real story. Baby Faye was born on October 14th, 1984, and became the first infant ever to survive a heart transplant. And the heart that was given to her was actually a baboon heart. Unfortunately, she passed away less than a month later, but it was still a groundbreaking medical procedure, because she lived weeks longer than any recipient of a non-human heart. Also, throughout town, you can see several election signs supporting Reagan, who went on to win the 1984 election for president. There's another moment where we see Will being studied in a lab, and much like Eleven in season one, he has electrodes attached to his head, which was really reminiscent of Firestarter, the 1984 film starring Drew Barrymore. Then later in the episode, Will and Jonathan watch a movie with their mom, Joyce, and her new boyfriend, Bob. And that movie is Mr. Mom, which was a 1983 comedy starring Michael Keaton, which is kind of meta considering Winona Ryder got her big break in Beetlejuice starring alongside Michael Keaton just five years after that in 1988. Do you, Lydia, take this man? No! Be Beetle! <laughs> She's a little bit nervous. Then there's one of the new antagonists, Billy, who's magnificently 80s with his mullet and earring. And if you were thinking that that look was familiar to you, then you might be thinking of Rob Lowe in St. Elmo's Fire. It's pretty clear that this character's appearance was based on that character. And then finally, the last Easter egg slash reference in episode one is when Will opens the front door to his house to reveal a red stormy sky with the shadow monster barely visible. Now this shot was obviously inspired by the iconic shot in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, so I thought that was a really cool nod to that film. Now on to episode two, which is titled Trick or Treat Freak. So just to get the super obvious references out of the way, the group of kids that we follow throughout this entire series are wearing Ghostbusters costumes for Halloween, which came out over the summer of 1984. And at one point, their new friend Max scares them with the Michael Myers mask from the movie Halloween. Then there are a few other costumes. For instance, at one point, Eleven puts on a sheet to look like a ghost in an attempt to convince Hopper to let her go trick-or-treating. Now that moment reminded me a lot of E.T. when the kids put the sheet over him in order to sneak him past their parents. Then there's the Halloween party that features a ton of really cool costumes, but you gotta keep your eyes peeled because if you blink, you might miss some of them. Steve and Nancy are dressed as the two main characters from Risky Business, which makes sense because she has a Tom Cruise poster in her room. And then in the first season, Steve refers to Tom Cruise as your lover boy from Risky Business. Then there's a girl at the costume party that briefly talks to Jonathan. She's dressed up as Susie Sue from the band Susie and the Banshees. You can also spot a Karate Kid costume, a Rocky costume, and Bluto from Animal House. Also, there's another Terminator reference in this episode when Eleven is flipping through the channels we see a brief glimpse of the original trailer for Terminator. An adventure unlike anything you've ever seen before. Arnold Schwarzenegger is the Terminator. And speaking of Eleven watching TV, at one point she stops on a channel that's just static and sits in front of the TV, which of course was a nod to the iconic scene in 1982's Poltergeist. Then there's episode three, The Polywog, which borrows heavily from Gremlins after Dustin finds a strange creature sniffing around in his trash can and takes it in as his pet. However, while Gremlins can't come in contact with water, this creature can't come in contact with sunlight. Anyway, Dustin names his creature D'Artagnan, 
which is the main character in The Three Musketeers. And the reason he picks that name is because he's feeding this creature a Three Musketeers candy bar while they bond. And speaking of feeding an otherworldly creature candy, that moment really reminded me of E.T. when Elliot gives him Reese's Pieces. And I'm pretty sure that was intended, because if you look at the top of Dustin's dresser in that scene, there's a very visible E.T. toy. And then there's episode 4, Will the Wise, which probably had the least amount of Easter eggs or references that I was able to catch. One that I did think was kind of cool, though, was when Eleven is looking at the boxes in Hopper's basement. And before she grabs the one that's labeled Hawkins Laboratory, she looks past one that says New York and one that says Vietnam, both of which mark really significant chapters in Hopper's life. Also, at the end of this episode, while Hopper is digging in the pumpkin patch, to me it looked a little bit like Indiana Jones and in Raiders of the Lost Ark when he's out digging in the desert. Speaking of digging, now on to episode 5, Dig Dug. Now I just mentioned Hopper kind of looking like Indiana Jones at the end of the last episode, but in this episode it's much more obvious. When he's exploring the tunnels, it looks like a scene straight out of one of the Indiana Jones films. But the most obvious nod to Indiana Jones was when Hopper is escaping the tunnels and almost forgets his hat, so he goes back and grabs it just in the nick of time, which is a common trope throughout the Indiana Jones franchise. <laughs> Then, later in the episode, when Mike tells Will that he should use his connection with the Shadow Monster to spy on it, it reminded me a little bit of Harry Potter and his connection with Voldemort. At different points in that franchise, they're able to use their connection against each other, which is what happens in this season of Stranger Things. Also, one of my favorite references in this entire season came from Sean Astin, who most of you know from Goonies. After Will draws the huge map of the tunnels that spread out throughout the entire house, Bob is trying to help them figure out what it is and where it leads to. So when they tell him he has to find the X, he asks what are we going to find there, pirate treasure? Which was clearly a little wink at the film that gave him his big break. Then at the end of the episode, when Will collapses outside of the tunnels and starts shaking violently on the ground, the expression on his face reminded me a lot of Donald Sutherland's expression at the end of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Then there's episode 6, The Spy. The fog that rolls into the junkyard as the kids are trying to trap the Demodog reminds reminded me a little bit of Stephen King's The Mist or John Carpenter's The Fog. Also, as Steve is approaching the Demodog, he realizes that he's surrounded by multiple Demodogs. So while they were trying to trap one of them, all of the Demodogs were trapping them. So that reminded me a lot of the scene in Jurassic Park, where they realize that they're surrounded by Velociraptors. <laughs> Then when the soldiers are going into the tunnels beneath Hawkins' lab, someone tells them stay frosty boys, which was a reference to 1986's Aliens. We're all in strung out shape. But stay frosty. Coincidentally, Paul Reiser, who plays one of the doctors in the lab, also starred in that film. Anyway, I mentioned a second ago how Will and the Shadow Monster's connection reminded me a little bit of Harry Potter and Voldemort. But another thing it reminded me of was John Carpenter's The Thing, because the Shadow Monster is able to use Will as a vessel and manipulate him in order to get to others, which is basically what the creature in The Thing does. Then there's the controversial episode 7, The Lost Sister. Early in this episode, a rude stranger bumps into Eleven, who then quietly responds by calling the stranger a mouth breather, which was an insult that Mike taught her in season one, so that was a cool little callback. I was tripped by this mouth breather Troy, okay? Mouth breather? Yeah, you know, a dumb person. Later, we see a quick clip of the show Punky Brewster on TV. Now, for those who aren't familiar with that show, it follows a young, abandoned girl who's adopted by a grumpy older man, which is a major plot point in Stranger Things Season 2, since Hopper takes Eleven into his home and takes care of her. To make the reference even more obvious, though, the episode that we see a glimpse of is one where Punky has a bad dream about doctors. I dreamt I was in the doctor's office. All of a sudden, he started giving me my shot in my arm. Then, the needle got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it was the size of a telephone pole. Then there's episode 8, The Mind Flayer. In this episode, our heroes have to find the circuit breaker to turn the power back on in Hawkins' lab and escape the Demodogs, which yet again took me back to Jurassic Park. Mr. Hammond, I think we're back in business. 
Then later in the episode, we see some shots of the shadow monster traveling through the tunnels from its point of view, which reminded me a little bit of Tremors. Then finally, there's episode 9, The Gate. Now this season of Stranger Things was more heavily influenced by horror than the first season, and that was more apparent than ever when Joyce, Jonathan, and Nancy tied Will to the bed, just like Linda Blair's character in The Exorcist. There's even a point where he gets one of his hands loose and grabs his mother by the throat, which is something that happens in The Exorcist as well. Then when the other kids are going through the tunnels with Steve, who's the oldest of all of them, he's wearing a red bandana, just like Josh Brolin's character in The Goonies, who also was the oldest of that group. And the last one takes place at the school dance at the very end of the episode. At one point, all of the kids are paired up and they're slow dancing, except for poor Dustin. None of the girls would dance with him. So he sits off to the side and starts crying when Nancy comes over and asks if he'll dance with her. This was a really sweet moment, considering the fact that in the very first episode of the entire series, it's established that Dustin has a little bit of a crush on his friend's older sister. But this moment was also obviously inspired by Pretty in Pink. When John Cryer is asked to dance, by Christy Swanson. Dustin's hairdo was also inspired by Cryer's character in that film as well. Anyway, those are all of the Easter eggs and references that I caught in season two of Stranger Things, but I'm sure that I missed a lot, so if you saw any that I didn't mention, let me know in the comments section. Also, be sure to check out my review for Stranger Things season two, like this video, subscribe to my channel, and follow me on all of my social media accounts, which you can find in the description section below. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, I'm your host. Jordan Ross.